everyone. Welcome. Welcome to those as well who are joining us on our Facebook Live instead of our Zoom. We'll try to answer your questions as well. Keep an eye on that chat um, if anyone has any questions. Uh, welcome to our Montessori Thrive Town Hall. I see some familiar faces, some new faces. For those of you who are new, um, we host these town halls weekly as a space for uh, Montessori leaders to connect with one another and hear from some thought leaders in school leadership and in the Montessori space. Uh, we're really lucky today to have a great speaker. I'm gonna introduce her shortly, but first, uh, just some housekeeping. Uh, so you'll notice that when you join the meeting, um, you're muted. This is just because we have um, a few people on the call. So just to make it, um, a little bit, you know, just a lesson the interruptions. Uh, if you have any comments or questions that pop into your mind, please feel free to use the chat. We'll, um, we'll visit all of the questions in the end. If you're joining us from Facebook Live instead of Zoom, you can also drop any questions in the chat there. We'll, we'll keep an eye on it as well. Um, all right, so today we're gonna be talking about uh, conflict resolution in the workplace and just conflict management. This is something that as a school leader, I'm sure you've dealt with or will have to deal with at some point in your career. Um, we're joined by a great speaker today. You might have already seen her at one of our previous town halls. Um, Chaney Wolchansky is here. She's gonna be sharing her strategies. She's from Schools of Excellence. If you haven't checked out her website and her podcast, I highly recommend you do so. I'll drop the link in the chat. Um, I'll go ahead and let Chaney take it from here. Hi, Camilla. Thank you so much for having me. It's good to be back here. Um, I was here, was it two months ago? I remember yeah, in January. January. Yeah. January. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, and I really enjoyed the audience. And I know now we're also streaming on Facebook. So there's a chance to connect with a lot of other people. Um, so for those of you who don't know who I am, I am a mom of four little kids before anything else. I have a four-year-old, a seven-year-old, a 10-year-old, and an 11-year-old. So I've got my hands full at home. And then I'm also working with clients, school leaders, owners, and directors, um, VPs of operation, regional managers, and we work with them on their culture, their leadership, their retention, um, and really just helping them up level their leadership and who they are and how they wanna show up in the world. So today's conversation is about conflict. And I wanna get started with your definition of how you view conflict now. And currently, most people view conflict as bad. It's this kind of black or white, it's either good or bad. And when we hear the word conflict, we automatically make this assumption that it's something not good or something to avoid or something to try to be proactive about ensuring that it doesn't happen. So let me know in the comments if that's currently your um, interpretation of conflict. Again, there is no right or wrong answer. We're just taking an assessment of like, where is currently the mindset of the group? And if you're on Facebook or you're on Zoom, just share with us. Again, um, my training sessions are not me talking at you. Um, this is an engagement conversation, so I'll be sharing. And then I'll also be asking for feedback as we go along so I can continue to keep my pulse on who is actually in this room. Um, so thank you. So Jennifer looks at conflict as an opportunity for progress, better alignment, opportunity to have discussion. Fabulous. Yes, that's beautiful, right? So th there's one way to look at it, which is, you know, it's not a good thing. There's another way to look at it as, as it, this is an opportunity for discussion. When, when we have the mindset that conflict is an opportunity for discussion, the first thing you need to understand is that's a higher level elevation of thinking. That is not the MO of your average person. Definitely not your staff. Your staff do not look at conflict as, oh, this is great. Now I have a chance to make progress. Now I have a chance to have a conversation. That is not the way that they approach conflict. You as a school leader, through training, through experiences, through exposure to other leaders, you've developed this mindset. You are not born this way, right? Nor did you come into your uh, career this way. This is something that over time we develop this because we understand through emotional maturity that conflict is. There is no relationship that doesn't have conflict. So if you look at any books that there are in relationships, marriage, parenting, um, school leadership, business development, no book says, here's how to eliminate conflict from the workplace. 
the books are always around here's how to navigate conflict right i just saw a new book that came out uh for marriages here's how to fight better right the book isn't here's how to stop fighting the book is here's how to fight better right because all couples have arguments it doesn't mean that your relationship is doomed for failure it means you need to learn how to communicate better with one another but you're going to have disagreement because in every relationship there is going to be conflict it's not good or bad it just is and so the first approach when we're looking at conflict management in our centers is our interpretation of conflict do we look at it as something that needs to be avoided and needs to be constantly taken proactive steps to eliminate or do we look at it as this invitation for dialogue and conversation okay so that's the first thing we want to look at the next thing we want to look and understand is how when our staff are you know connecting with one another or engaging with one another what are the words the choice of words or the um the energy that they're bringing into the conversation so again i want to go high level for you and walk you through what we're noticing right now in the industry and in the world in general um we have spent the last two years hiding behind screens and what happens is is when we have less interaction eye to eye and face to face with people we become a little bit desensitized to that when you say this word in the presence of someone else's body and physical presence it means something different than when you're typing it anonymously on a computer screen and so Many people have become desensitized to, no, 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 like you would never say that to someone's face. Like, how? what are you doing? Like, you can't say that. Um, and so what's, what, I'm, what I'm noticing now is the things that people would never say to someone's face that they would type on the screen, now they're actually saying to people's faces. And you're like, oh my gosh, did you, what? And so there's a lot of this breakdown of communication where we used to have these kind of unspoken rules in society where it's like, okay, you just don't say that to someone's face. Well, you might say that behind her back, but you don't say that. And now there's like no rules. Like now it's like, oh, you could do that or you could say this or, and, and there's, there's, um, a desensitization, a desensitizing to what it means to speak with kindness, with generosity, with respect, with integrity. And when you give someone feedback, that is not your invitation to call someone, hey, you know, you're a liar. Like you, you didn't tell me the truth yesterday. You're a liar. No, there's another way to say to someone when they spoke with lack of integrity or their words were blurred with tr with 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 uh, misinformation or whatever it is right i actually don't like the word misinformation so take that out of my thing i did not say that word i don't like that word um where you know the person said something and you're like you know what I, I i don't know if that's true like i don't know if that's actually what happened as opposed to calling the person no you're a liar you're lying right because when we use these strong words like um, you're entitled, you're lying, you're obnoxious, um, you know, you're rude or you're always late or whatever it is. We are forgetting that those are words that are about a person's behavior, not about the person or his character. And when you tell a person you're a liar, you are labeling, labeling them as a person that you're the liar, as opposed to the behavior and the way that you chose to show up in that moment was out of integrity. There's a very big difference between the two of them. And one of the reasons that many teachers are conflict avoidant and don't want to engage in dialogue is because they don't want to know what's on the other side of this conversation right what's the famous quote don't ask a question you don't want the answer to and so they don't want to engage in the dialogue because that means i have to hear what the other person has to say and i don't know if i want to hear what the other person has to say because maybe the other person's going to be mean and they might be and so what this does at a meta level, so you understand as a leader, is it, it systematically breaks down trust and the ability for people to feel like they belong in your center, to feel like they have a place in this community. So 
why does the lack of trust or the inability to resolve conflict impact culture or impact their ability to belong? Well, here's why. There is a difference between belonging and fitting in. When you try to fit in, okay, think of your days when you were in middle school or high school or college. When you're trying to fit in, you're trying to mold yourself to be like everyone else. And so you laugh at jokes that aren't funny. You make comments that, you know, you would never do. And so you're just trying to like fit into the puzzle piece. You're not being you. Whereas when you belong, you don't have to laugh at other people's jokes or do any of that kind of stuff. You can be who you are without worrying about, oh, if I don't speak up in this moment, am I not going to be belong here anymore? Or if I say this one thing, is that going to determine my character forever? And now I'm going to be ostracized from the group, right? You belong to that community. And a school is a community. It is not a family. It is a community. And when we belong to a community, we feel a sense of safety. I belong here. I don't have to constantly worry about, oh, I shouldn't say this. Oh, maybe if I say this, da, da, da. or, you know, what if I, what if I do that? Then this person might like, you, so you just don't talk. You just keep quiet all the time because you're terrified what, what's going to happen if I say something. You don't only keep quiet, you don't take action. Because what if I decide to go do this and then someone comes to me and says, why'd you do it that way? That was stupid. Or there's a much smarter way to do it. Or, you know, that's not, you know, the, the Montessori philosophy. Like, wh where did you get trained? Right? People say these things. And so teachers shut down, right? Let me just do what I was told, follow the agenda, follow the rules that's the safest path to take i'm going to pause for a second before i go further jump into the comments what are you hearing so far we do this often during my sessions because it's important to pause because i'm not here to do a fire hose of verbal vomit comment content on you we're here to learn we're here to process, we're here to reflect together, make sure our brains are really understanding what it is that we're saying. Again, there's no right answer. So whatever you share is your truth. So don't feel like, oh, I'm going to say something. It's not going to be the right thing. Everyone's going to think I'm stupid. Da, 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 da. Right? Just, just share. Janet, love your comments about belonging versus fitting in. Beautiful. I'm glad that resonated with you, Janet. Rose, fitting in has anxiety underlying. Yes. Oh, my gosh. When you try to fit in, it's exhausting. Oh, it's so tiring. Uh... Deborah, I liked your point about community versus family. Often with staff, when friendships form, they don't want to address issues. Yeah, right? Because now it's like, is the friendship in jeopardy? Well, think about a healthy marriage. When there are issues, a healthy couple talks about them because they care enough about the relationship to resolve the issue. I care enough about our relationship that this thing that you're doing is hurting me. And so I need to tell you that because you're not intentionally hurting me, right? What's the famous quote? The road to hell is paved with good intentions, right? So no, my husband is not trying to hurt me, but I need to have this conversation if I care enough about the relationship. And so the best relationships are the ones that lean into conflict. Jennifer, keeping quiet, not taking action when you don't feel safe is so true. Yes. Oh, and in this world that we're living in right now, everyone's like, just shut up, sit down, do nothing, do as you're told, because that's the safest way to go. And as leaders, you can't accept that because innovation and creativity and 
the evolution of your business depends on your risk taking, on your ability to challenge things. I was talking with leaders a couple of weeks ago, um, and I was saying, you know, when a leader stays complacent with her level of success, or she's like, again, he or she is saying, hey, I've achieved this level of success. I don't want to mess it up. So I'm not going to take any other risks. I'm just going to maintain the status quo. Not continuing to take risks will implode your business because you have to consistently put yourself out there. And this is why leaning into these conversations and helping our staff redevelop their critical thinking skills. And the reason I say redevelop is because pre-pandemic, I do believe a lot of staff had critical thinking skills. I think the pandemic has shut down people's thinking, truly shut it down, has through all of the environment and messages it has shut down the ability to say, is that what I really want? Is that really the best thing to do? Right, and we become paralyzed. So we don't think anymore. You cannot have a thriving center if you're the only person who thinks critically. You, you just can't. Every person on the team needs to learn how to think and ask questions and take risks and engage in dialogue, which means they're going to engage in conflict. So we have this concept, right? We're really trying to understand how do we help our staff become more comfortable to lean into those difficult conversations, right? The leaders that are sitting here or on Facebook, you know, I'm, I'm making an assumption a little bit that your mindset is, yes, conflict is an opportunity for growth. Conflict is, excuse me, an opportunity for connection, but not necessarily are your teachers feeling that way. The first thing I want to share is when we engage in conflict, there are four shields to the difficult conversation. This is a concept I talk about a lot in schools of excellence. I actually have um, a four part podcast series as well called the four shields of the difficult conversation. So I'm going to share with you what those four shields are. And I'm going to give you some strategies of how to start to coach your staff on that. So when you engage in a conversation with a teacher, whether you're talking to her, whether you're doing a performance review with her, or you are giving her some feedback on a learning circle that she did, or maybe she prepared a specific, you know, learning center, and there is a way to do it a little bit more um, developmentally appropriate or whatever it is, right? You're just, you're sitting down. There's typically gonna be four, one of four responses that they're gonna choose. Either they're gonna start crying, they're gonna start blaming, they're going to deflect, or they're going to play the victim card. Now, that doesn't mean those are the only four. Those are the most common that we've seen in early childhood settings from the data and research that we've done. So now let me explain each one. Crying is exactly like it sounds, right? You go into a conversation with someone and you start giving them feedback and they start crying. They start getting really upset and they get emotionally hurt. And you've only gone through like four words of like what you actually want to talk to them about. And you're four words in and they need tissues. Just give me a yes in the comments if you've ever navigated a conversation with a teacher who started crying. So we're familiar, right? We're familiar with, with being in the presence of someone who is crying or, you know, very emotionally upset. Crying is a reflex response to hearing something that makes you uncomfortable or makes you sad or any emotion that it triggers. Crying is not an invitation to shut down the conversation but a default response that a lot of leaders have is the moment she starts crying it's like oh, i'm so sorry i made you so upset okay fine we'll talk about this another time it's okay and 
just like toddlers learn in the checkout counter, that if I cry in tantrum, mama buys me the candy. It's not a conscious thought. I always say this to people that I work with. I'm like, toddlers do not come into Walmart and say, okay, when mama goes into the checkout counter, we got to start the waterworks so we can get the toy. Their brains are not that developed. It's environmental and subconscious. Your staff are the same way. They've learned that when I cry, I can stop the conversation. And you need to lean into the conversation. So when you're entering dialogue with staff, the first thing I always say is, this is gonna be a really difficult conversation. I need to talk to you about something that might make you uncomfortable. And you might get upset, you might cry. And I'm here. I'm here to talk about it because I care deeply about you and your success in our program. And when we're developing and growing, there's growing pains. And it's okay to cry. I have a box of tissues here, I have water. And you take as much time as you need, but we're gonna get through the conversation. You said the context in the beginning that crying is not your exit strategy. The next one is blaming. You'll have this with parents a lot when you engage in parent dialogue or with staff. You'll talk to them about something that went on in the center. They'll be like, well, you know, it was really Janet's fault that this happened because of X, Y, and Z. Or, you know, she didn't submit her thing on time and that's why I couldn't do it. Or do you know what's going on over here? Like, you know, and they're shifting blame. Um, the most recent one is COVID's like the best excuse. Oh my gosh. Why didn't you submit the things? Oh, COVID. Why? Oh, COVID. So that's like the best thing to blame on now in the, in the last few years. When someone's blaming, what they're looking for is, please don't shine the light on me. There's other people that are also responsible for this. They're not looking for Can you make sure everyone gets held accountable? They're just making sure, just don't hold me accountable. You gotta know that there's a lot of other people in this story. And so they're looking to blame and shift it from themselves. Someone who takes pride and personal responsibility doesn't do that, right? They listen. Where am I, where, where, where am I at fault here? Where do I have room to grow? They're not worried about other people getting punished or getting accountable to that. So in the same way that when you're doing a parent conference, you'll have a parent who will say, can we talk about Benji? I know he's been hitting kids a lot. Or can we talk about this kid? What do you coach your teachers to do? You tell them to redirect the conversation back to the parent. This conversation is about your beautiful child, Sam. So we're gonna talk about Sam. Yeah, but I really wanna talk about Benji. We're gonna talk about Sam. I'm gonna tell you something else about Sam. And you're just a broken record with kindness. Same thing is with the teacher. Oh, but this happened, we're talking about you. We're talking about how you showed up in this moment. We're talking about your role in this obstacle. I'm going to have separate conversations with other people. We're talking about your role in this obstacle. Notice how I'm not blaming the teacher. Notice how I'm not getting upset. I'm not getting frustrated that she's blaming. I'm speaking with, we're talking about your role in the conversation. Your emotional equilibrium your ability to regulate your nervous system in these moments of high conflict is what the teachers mirror. When a child falls off the slide and, start, and looks at mom, right? They always look at mom before they start crying. Why? Am I okay? Right? Teachers are doing the same thing. They're reading your body language. This is why leadership is so hard. This is why you have to pause and breathe before you go into a difficult conversation. 
you do not go into conversations flying by the seat of your pants. You prepare, you sit down, you hydrate your brain with water, you breathe, you need to be ready. Let's talk about um, deflection. Deflection is really difficult because people who use deflection have had a lifetime of using this strategy to get out of all kinds of nonsense. And so deflection will typically work in different ways. If someone uses humor as deflection, you'll see them start cracking jokes in the middle of a conversation. Many times they'll deflect and start talking about something else. So they'll kind of, and then five minutes and you're like, why are we talking about her picket fence? And you're like, you're like in a totally different world all of a sudden. It's the master of deflection. Breathe. We're not talking about the picket fence. We're talking about the papers that needed to be submitted on time, right? Bringing her back in. And victimhood is really, really hard because as leaders, and especially as leaders in childcare, we have a lot of empathy for people that are struggling or people that are going through a hard time. And, you know, I was talking to someone a couple of weeks ago and she's just getting to know me. Like she's, she doesn't know me very well. And she was like, um, She's like, you look like you always have, you know, yourself together and everything's like going smoothly. And I'm like, what? But just because I look like I don't have problems, it doesn't mean I don't have any. Everyone's got their own shit. Like, don't even think for a second that some people don't have problems in life. Everyone does. Everyone does. You decide to approach it like a warrior or like a victim. It's a choice. It is a choice. And there are some people who have not recognized that they can choose to not be a victim. They're still stuck in a mindset of like, what do you mean? Like the whole world is conspiring against me. Like if this one thing was different, my classroom would be different. If Mike wasn't in the classroom, I would be an amazing teacher. If I wasn't working with this teacher, I would be amazing. If this wasn't happening, I would be great. If that, right, everything is about, well, just move this one variable and it will all be good for me. But that never happens. When you're talking to someone who's playing the victim card, the best strategy is to talk to the warrior inside of them. Every person has a warrior inside of them. Just covered with a lot of muck and dust. And so I'll say that to the teacher straight in her face. Like she'll start playing the victim card. I'll be like, I'm going to talk to Emily's warrior because inside of you, there is a part of you that wants to get out of this. I'm going to talk to the warrior in you because I know that you don't wanna feel this way. And there is help and there is solutions if you want them. I wanna pause for a second and I wanna open up the floor for any specific questions on what I've shared so far, if you have a specific scenario that you wanted me to work you through before I continue. Um, through some of the other content, because again, I've, I've shared a lot and it's a lot to process and digest. And so I want to help you really walk away with something very tangible. So feel free to unlock yourself um, and ask a question about anything I've shared or a specific scene that you want to work through. Feel free to unmute yourself as well if you want to ask a question. It's the very daring to be the first to speak up. Yeah, Mara, go for it. Hi. Uh, Hi. So, um, what about? dealing with a conflict where a teacher comes at you with a problem aggressively um kind of hostile 
uh, you know, the tone is very loud or, mm. um, you know, makes <clears throat> empty threats and stuff like that. <laughs> or, um, so how do you, how do you deal with that in that situation? Yeah. Thank you. Sure. So I would actually love if you could be more specific with me, because I'd love to coach to that specificity and then I'll, I'll level up and, and kind of help everyone. Yeah. So, um, one of my directors had a conversation with one of her staff. Her staff was uh, visibly upset that they had taken a staff from their classroom to move them to another one due to ratio. This is a Montessori child care center. And this, the nature of the, you know, child care industry, uh, you have to follow licensing and ratio. So she was sure. very upset, but she was within ratio. She had plenty of staff. There were low numbers that day. And um, so she went to the director yelling and screaming and the director, you know, tried to calm the situation, but is looking to me for advice on how to handle that situation. So is she looking for advice on how to, okay, so I have a couple questions. One, is this a, is this a silo incident or is this a pattern of um, kind of emotional disruption of how she approaches challenges or when things don't go her way? This is a pattern. Um, okay. This is a situation where I've talked to the teacher personally sure. and just, you know, kindness, yeah. show her that um, sure. there is a solution and we will get to that, you know, but yeah. if this is constant, how do I? Yeah, such a great question. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So I um, I love this question. Um, I get to questions very similar to this. So I'm going to answer it by talking about something high level first. Um, and then I'm going to give you some specific coaching on how to have this conversation with her next. One of the new concepts that I just released last week at my live event was the concept of the bridge. I don't know if I spoke about it. Did I speak about it here ever? I don't think so. Um, okay, so the bridge are the six meta skills that all teachers and directors need to sustain excellence, okay? So I'll give you an example of what a meta skill is. If you think of sports, the meta skills in sports, whether that's um, soccer or basketball, is uh, mastering the skills of time and space. If a player understands how to create distance and space from his opponents and understands the timing of exactly how he needs to do that, all of the tactics fall into place. But those are meta skills that he needs to understand. I'll give you a different example. Speaking is a meta skill. If you know how to speak on stage, you can speak on Zoom, you can do a podcast, you can do a lot of things. Versus if you're a great writer, it doesn't mean you're a great speaker. Writing is not a meta skill. Speaking is a meta skill. And what meta means is that it's this high level skill that when you master that, you can master a whole bunch of other things that are integral to your success in whatever field you're looking to be successful in. And so in early childhood, there are six meta skills that we need to coach on as leaders in order for our staff to be successful in the classroom. So with Mara's example, this isn't about coaching her how to not get upset when something doesn't go her way. She needs one of the meta skills. So I'll tell you what they are. They're bridge. So it's an acronym for boundaries, relational intelligence, individual advocacy, discernment, generosity, and emotional regulation. And so with this teacher's meta skill is emotional regulation. I always tell staff, you can give a teacher every single tool under the sun of how to deal with a biting incident of how to deal with a you know kid who threw a block of how to navigate uh, a transition every single strategy or tactic that ever was created you can teach her but here is what happens in the classroom when you're in the heat of the moment you're down to your reflexes always remember that fighter pilots Every time they get on the plane, they follow the same routine. 
open the cockpit, turn the knob, pull the right, right? They follow their checklist to death, right? Like every single thing. Why? Because when the plane gets hit or when there's an accident, they don't have time to open the handbook and say, all right, what do we do when the plane's crashing? One, two, three. Are you kidding me? You got four seconds to respond. You're down to your reflexes. That's why they practice so that when they have five seconds to make a decision, they know exactly what to do in five seconds. When you're a teacher, you don't get to open your notebook and decide, okay, so Johnny hit Sam. What are we going to do? You're down to your reflexes. Your reflexes are created through your consistent training and experiences right and so this teacher is struggling with emotionally regulating her nervous system when she doesn't get what she wants so this isn't about hey let me help you understand how we're going to problem solve this is about she needs to learn how to regulate her nervous system she needs to learn how to breathe oxygen into her brain before she talks right so this is why i talk meta so I'm, first, I want to ask you, Meryl, you, your face is showing that you just had a breakthrough. So tell me what you're hearing or what your insight is. And then I'm going to walk you through a script of how to have this conversation. Uh, the breakthrough with the teacher or um, just what, uh, you're, what hearing. You're, you're your body's kind of showing like, oh, I got it. Yes, yes, I am flowing yeah. with ideas and everything. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, uh, just like we deal with, you know, the toddlers and the um, the children's house, uh, that three to six age level, we always give them a um, when they're happy and calm. We always do a breathing exercise, how to get themselves regulated. So, in the moment yes. of when they're feeling. Um, a lot of emotions yeah they have that practice to go back onto it because they know how to do it to re-regulate themselves mm -hmm. um and through some previous teaching or learning uh, facilities and stuff um by heavy breathing myself usually the person who i'm talking to or interacting whether it be a child or a teacher they kind of mirror that same Absolutely. thing yes. so um by giving the skills to my directors as in yeah. be in that calm state heavy deep breathe they will mirror as well and then until that teacher has regulated themselves then they can be at a calm state to have an appropriate conversation mm -hmm. um and then yeah that's that's yeah. my mind right now yeah so mm -hmm. the conversation that the director needs to have with this teacher is in a one on one and the one on one conversation is really going to be about um, helping this teacher develop self awareness of how she shows up in these moments. Um, many times teachers are not even cognizantly aware that they are throwing these comments out and when we bring awareness they're like oh my gosh i'm so sorry I did not realize the disruption that i'm causing. Um, and so the first step in any change is the self awareness stage, which is one of the hardest things to do as leaders because you have to bring awareness to this person's leadership gap and their their gap in how they're showing up and so the director needs to sit down one-on-one -on -one and 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 help this teacher um, be aware of what she's doing and then this is where coaching and empathy comes in and saying i can't imagine how difficult it is to have your day disrupted or have something not go your way like it's it's really difficult and i want to have a brainstorming conversation where when you're leading a childcare classroom, this isn't a matter of if your schedule is going to be disrupted, it's when your schedule gets disrupted. Because my love, your schedule is going to be disrupted every single day that you will work here as long as you will be a child care provider. And that is absolute freaking truth. You will never go through a day in my center or in any center with your schedule not being disrupted. And so what we actually need to do here is one, we need to come to terms with that. We need to make some peace with there will always be disruptions. And then the second thing is we need to choose our strategy. What are we going to do when there's disruption? And then you can give her an example. Marathon runners, do you think they don't get tired? They do. 
Here's what they do. Before the race, they mentally tell themselves, what am I going to do when I get tired? Where am I going to put my tired? What am I going to tell myself when I'm tired? Because I'm going to get tired, but I want to finish this race. They don't go into the marathon and say, I'm not going to get tired. Of course, you're going to get tired. You're running a marathon. <laughs> so tell me how that feels for you, Mara, like that conversation. Are you feeling more empowered? Do you feel like you have some tools to go into that dialogue? Yes. Whatever Great. you have given me back, Perfect. I am confident that we will go forward smoothly. Great. Yay. Beautiful. I'm so happy to hear that. And thank you for asking that question. I'm sure this was helpful for everyone. So thank you. Okay. I want to do one more specifically on conflict. Um, again, ask, you can go as high level or as, you know, um, specific as you want. Penny, this is Wally. Uh, Hi. Just, before we go into something else, can I just follow up on your conversation you had with Mara? Please. Uh, because we have a similar situation where I think we have a very talented teacher who has, who has the skill that is lacking in the, the key part, the emotional regulation skill of the bridge that you mentioned. Um, now, uh, I think what you told her, told Mara, is I think that makes sense to kind of step back and essentially walk her through. Yes. But um, generally, I think in a, I mean, we find that no matter how you approach it, I mean, people have that defensive mechanism set up so high, they may not even listen to what you're trying to say. Uh, is there a nice, I mean, is there a proper way to kind of make people aware of what skills they're missing sure. without, uh, without making them defensive? I think the way you said it definitely helps. Yeah. There's some other strategies that you might recommend. Yeah, such a good question. Okay, so let's go high level and then I'm going to go specific with you. Okay, so high level is you, we need to design a culture where this is a growth mind, uh, mindset culture. And in a growth mindset culture, in a growth-minded school, we are constantly seeking, actively seeking feedback to be in the pursuit of excellence. So I'll give you an example. When I hire people, one of the things I tell people in the first interview is, we are a company that has difficult conversations. We are a company that does not push anything under the rug. And when something is uncomfortable, we lean into the discomfort. And so in this business, I will be giving you feedback on your performance and you will be giving me feedback on my performance and how I'm showing up as a leader because I want to get better in serving and coaching you and I want you to get better in serving and coaching the people that you need to work with. And I ask them, is that something that excites you? Is that something that you want to be a part of? Do you want to be a part of a culture where we give each other feedback, where we celebrate wins and successes, where we're constantly looking at what is my strength? What is my leadership gap? What is my strength? What is my leadership gap, right? So that's kind of really high level to design your culture, that this is a place where we have open dialogue and conversation. The second thing is um, when we're starting this journey where we need to help uh, people even understand that there are that they don't have all the skills in the world um, is doing an initial kickoff staff meeting. So this is where I typically like to, you know, when you're the next time you're bringing everyone together, it's really having a, a conversation with the team around, you know, what is your superpower? What are you really great at? And what are some of your gaps, right? Like, I'm really great at creating content for an event, but I hire an event manager who remembers to bring plates and cups and tables and napkins and chairs because if I'm running the event, I'm not going to remember those things ever. That is not where my brain goes, <laughs> right? My brain is I need to prepare the best content. OK, so does that mean that that's a gap of mine? Sure. And if I want to put on events, I have to hire someone to make sure that I put on a good event. Right. In a classroom setting, there are specific skills you can't hire out. You need to emotionally regulate. You need to learn boundaries. Right. I can't hire six people and each of them have one of these skills. Right. Like these are skills that you need to have as a leader. And so at this kickoff staff meeting, what you're doing is you're starting to normalize nobody's perfect. Nobody 
is a superstar teacher. Everyone is good at different things. There's no such thing as, oh, she's the master. She's amazing at everything. No, she's not. No, she's not. Nobody is because no one's perfect, right? So Mara is phenomenal at communicating to parents about fighting incidents or potty training accidents. Like she's great at that. If you struggle with that, you should go talk to her. She's got some great insight and language on how to navigate that. But if you need help on how to set up your, you know, um, real life centers, oh, you got to talk to Lisa. She's like, she's got great ideas. Now, is Lisa more of a superstar than this one? No. Lisa's just really great at this. And she's really great at that. And so the first step is the deactivation of the ego and leaning into humility and curiosity. Nobody is good at everything. And here's the hardest part for new teachers. This is the hardest thing for new teachers to accept. You are going to be terrible at almost everything you do on your first day because it's your first day. And I don't expect you to be amazing because guess what? When I was a teacher, let me tell you about the screw ups that I did. You're not supposed to have a flawless circle time. It's your second day, my love. You're supposed to make a lot of mistakes. We still like you. Keep showing up. You're not supposed to have a flawless transition. You have 18 two-year-olds. It's okay. They're not supposed to walk in a straight line. They're not in the army. They're kids. And so what happens is teachers come in with this like, this is the way it's supposed to go. Every kid's gonna sit perfectly for 15 minutes. Every child's gonna perfectly walk to the sink and wash their hands and not throw the paper towel on the floor. Every kid's gonna walk over here and not flick on and off the lights or pull Lisa's hair or poke him with the finger or pull this. No one's gonna have any accidents. Every kid's gonna make it to the toilet in time. No parents are gonna get upset. I'm like, are you kidding me? In what world does that exist? Right. But teachers in their minds define their worth by how well the classroom runs. And so when you come to them and tell them, hey, here's some improvement, what you're telling him is you're not good enough. That's what they're hearing. No, 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 no. You are beautiful. You are good enough. And here's how to stay in the pursuit of excellence. Because the pursuit of excellence is not that you're not good enough. It's the choice to do better every single day, not the choice to be perfect, the choice to do better. Is that helpful, Wally? Yes, it is. It is very helpful. I think um, if I'm hearing you behind between the, the statements, uh, are you suggesting also that uh, during the initial orientation meeting at the beginning of the, uh, the school year, it's a good idea to talk about some of these things about the yes the bridge concept and all that and make them familiar with it? Yeah, I think at the beginning, it's it's really understanding the company core values and helping them understand, here's how we live and practice these values. One of the values in my organization is, are you coachable? I will not hire someone who is not coachable. And what does it mean to be coachable? It means that when I come to you and I tell you, here is an area that is a gap for you, you are willing and you are excited to be coached on this area to get better. I have let so many people go in my company who were not coachable. I don't work with people who are not coachable. I don't care how skilled you are. I don't. I care that you are coachable. Because you can come in with the best skills in the world. But guess what? This world is changing like this which means in two weeks, your skills might be obsolete. Are you gonna be humble enough to say, I don't know how to do this. I gotta go learn, I gotta go get coached. Or are you gonna come in and say, I'm the master at this. If it's not working, it's cause you're messed up. Or I don't wanna deal with this. This is the way I do things. The world is changing so fast. 
I heard an amazing quote from Marshall Goldsmith. He's a, an amazing leadership thinker. And he said, um, the pace of change that you're experiencing right now is the slowest it will ever be in your life. It's only going to get faster. The pace of how things are going to change is only going to get faster. Look at the news cycle. Every hour, it's like, oh, my God, and this is happening now, and this is going on now. What? 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 Uh, that was two hours ago, girl. You're like, you're, you're yesterday's news, <laughs> right? It's moving. And so you are not going to survive if you are saying, these are my skills and this is all I do. You have to be ready to grow and adapt. Okay. I want to wrap everything up here because we're just about at the top of the hour because we spoke about a lot of different concepts and every concept I could do another whole hour training on. <laughs> so we spoke about the four shields of the difficult conversation. If that is something that is intriguing to you and you want more tactical tools um, on how to implement it, definitely go check out the podcast. It's free. Everything inside of there is free. And you could check out um, just I break it down a lot more. So that's definitely an area that I, I would follow up on. The other thing is just the mindset of how you're approaching conflict, the mindset in um, how I'm approaching these conversations uh, with my staff, with my teachers, with the parents. <clears throat> The bridge is a brand new concept. I haven't released any podcast episodes about it. I just introduced it last week at my event, um, but stay tuned to more content on, on, on this concept. Um, and maybe I'll come back here and we'll do another town hall just on the bridge. Um, if you want, you can ask Camilla and she'll bring me back and we'll, we'll talk about it. <laughs> um, so that is, that is the, that is the third thing. Um, What I'm hoping that each of you are really taking away and, and would love for you to share in the comments just um, your biggest insight from today is I hope you're walking with a just a disruption of your regular pattern of thinking, meaning you came into this town hall thinking about conflict one way, thinking about something this way, and now you're looking at it from a new perspective. There's a new insight. There's a new perspective. That is what great training does. That is what rich, deep conversation should do. It should disrupt like, oh, okay, we need to do this, right? Or it should challenge a perspective of like, I've never thought of that before, right? Some of you wrote inside of here, like the difference between belonging and fitting in, right? When, when those, when that kind of disrupts our pattern, now we go into our leadership and conversations from a different way. So I would love to hear, um, some of your insights. Um, and then I also just wanted to share one more thing, Camilla, for, for anyone that does want to go further in dialogue and conversation with myself, with our company, definitely go check out our website. I'm going to put a link inside of here where um, you can apply and just work with us a little bit deeper if it's something that that you're interested in and want to check out. Um, so I'll move the floor to back to you, Camilla, and while people just share some of their insights and perspectives inside of here. All right, great. Thank you so much, Cheney. I think that was a really insightful conversation. I did drop the link to your podcast. Um, yes. It's on her website as well that has all of her other services. Cheney just dropped the, the link there. Yeah. Um, I do recommend taking a look. There's a lot of great resources for leaders. Um, I do have some announcements for um, Needle Marketing and Montessori Thrive. So if any of you are going to be at the AMS conference next week, we're going to be there. So um, we look forward to meeting any of you in person. We love to chat. We're going to be giving away some goodies. Um, and we're also going to be hosting our town hall um, live from the conference. Um, we're going to be answering all of your Montessori marketing questions. So if you're a Montessori school that wants to learn new ways to grow enrollment, um, maybe have some uh, questions on your school website or um, running digital ads for your school, finding the right prospective families, uh, please come talk to us. Um, Camille is also going to be giving a presentation on the Friday morning. Um, it's a great workshop for administrators. So um, if you're there, be sure to catch it. Um, I'm going to uh, share the link to our town hall questionnaire. 
um, as we're going to be answering all uh, marketing questions live from the town hall um, from the conference. So if you have a question that you want answered, please um, just ask it there and we'll answer them uh, live next week during the town hall. Uh, you'll have me, Mysel, our client success manager, who is amazing, and Camille as well, who is our fearless leader. Um, so we look forward to meeting you all there. Um, and thank you so much, Chaney. If anyone has any other questions for her, please look at her website. Please get in touch. Um, her and her team are really responsive and really amazing. Thank, um, you. thank you everyone for joining us. And I look forward to hopefully meeting some of you guys in person for the first time. Um, hope everyone has a great week. Stay happy, healthy. Um, I had a question here from Mara. Will we be receiving this recording? Um, we'll be posting this recording um, after the um town hall so I, it usually takes about two hours or something like that to get it posted um so um you should be able to watch it back thank All you right. <laughs> thank you so much Annie. thank you everyone have a great uh week